evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Crowcast Tuesday Night Live. My name is Phoenix, and with me tonight I have Donkey. How you going, Donk? Oh, every week it's like a tradition now. How are you, Donk? Sorry, I muted you. Oh, did you? Yeah, it's good to be with you, Fiend. <laughs> it's good to be with you, the listeners. <laughs> Peter, how you doing, mate? Yeah, good, mate, and uh, good evening, too, to the legends on the uh, the chat at Spreaker. Always great to have everybody along. Absolutely, and, of course, tonight we're brought to you, as usual, by Smith Partners Real Estate. Uh, you'll see uh, their details flash up on the screen if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, or else you can get around them at our website. There's some links there, and also Down to Earth Electric. Electrics, electrical. Down to Earth Electrical, uh, same thing. So get around them, and day to everyone on chat everyone on Facebook and all our Patreons, etc. Pete, what do you reckon? News? Chuck a new bit of news. Away we go. And uh, a lot of the news around the, uh, the uh, around this week is, um, is Adelaide uh, centric and none more so, I think, than the discussion around um, the, Josh Jenkins, Elliot Himmel uh, issue that everyone seems to be wanting to have their say on that. It's around most uh, media outlets and um, not least of whom is Josh Jenkins himself still having uh, a chat about the uh, the whole thing. So um, What's he said now? That, I haven't been across that. That's What's been an interesting now? one. <clears throat> oh, look, he, you know, he, he, he's said um, you know, various things. Uh, things just in terms of, um, I, I think the latest thing to come out was he, he felt that he he didn't um, hit the SNFL with the uh, with the correct attitude and uh, um, that he was on cruise control a little bit. And um, I think he's uh, it's probably dawning upon him that um, that this little the, the one week punish, punishment a la Bryce Gibbs is uh, starting to stretch out. Given the fact that uh, the Big Easy is um, is just uh, taking uh, just baby steps to uh, to cement himself in the side, so. Um, uh, you know, and then of course his mates at uh, SEN, Kane Corns in particular, having a lot to say about the fact that he should be reinstated. So it's oh, how ridiculous! Oh well, um, Cornsy, Cornsy doesn't want the Adelaide Crows to succeed, so it's not not a big stretch for him to want us to select Josh Jenkins again. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they just sort of just you know talk about the fact that we're uh, you know we're a better side with uh, with with Josh in, and he, and he must come back in. So yeah, of course he but, must. Uh, because the Big Easy kicked 2-2 two, two from, uh, you know, eight or nine posies and straightened us up and allowed Tex to uh, have the best out- output he's had for six, 12 months in the last two weeks. But, yeah, we need, yeah, Josh, and- we need Josh back. But, but but it's also I just think the Big Easy's the Big Easy for whatever he does, whether he's impacted in the contest or or any of the other little sort of one percent of thing he seems to do, it just seems to. Uh, a play that he's involved with somehow, somehow keeps turning into a goal for us, whereas that was definitely not happening with Josh. I mean, Josh snapped it into a post in a game we had to win with five, you know, five minutes ago, or whatever it was, um, a, a couple of weeks ago. Like, he's just, you know, he needs to show a lot more that he's committed and he actually wants to play 100% focused AFL footy all the time before he can start making demands on whether he's in the side. Sorry, mate, you're just not up to it. Yeah, I think it was a little bit um, sort of unfortunate in a way that, um, you know, in a way I should say is I don't know if, if you either of you caught the SNFL game on the weekend. I did, and um, the three goals that he got were just, um, you know, two of the three in particular were just, just coming. Gifts, weren't they? Well, McHenry was just about on the goal line and almost had to go backwards to give him the ball, and <laughs> and um, you know, and and Stengel, you know, was sort of similar, and and I just think, you know, I mean, God, if you if you're playing with kids like that who are, you know, trying to forge their way, I mean, surely as a senior player, you're saying just kick it yourself, son. But uh, no, um, Josh gratefully accepted the gifts from those two young guys and um, put a couple of goals on the board. And then he had a, a one out the back of where he did actually raise a bit of a gallop to you before he kicked the goal. And then, you know, then all of a sudden he's got three goals and 18 possessions and it looks like a game. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I think that nobody will be fooled, at least of all, the um the selectors I don't think because they'll they'll see the vision um it's there for everyone to see so well the problem um, I've got with him is his bloody attitude as we yeah, mentioned last terrible. week he's in the bloody leadership group what's he going on about he should just be yeah. head down bum up work work hard to get back into the team and I think I think the way he's taken this 
speaks speaks volumes for his uh, the perception of his attitude at times on the field. I think it's a very big insight. Yeah, I think you're right, <clears throat> and I think that if we look at the way Bryce Gibbs handled himself um, when he went back, I mean, he had a little bit of a whinge, but but by and large, he said, "Look, you know, I've, I've probably deserved this." And most importantly, once he'd had his chat to the media, that was it. He um, yeah. he shut up at that point and let his football do the talking and and won his uh, won his position back in the side. So probably a little bit different for Josh because you know they you know they're they're fighting for the one position and uh, very difficult now that you've got Himmelberg in there. And the temptation, of course, has to be, from the club's point of view, to sort of say, well, Himmelberg's 20 and Jenkins is 30. Yeah. And, you, you know, you've just got to, while you've got him there and whilst you're getting up, like, you know, inverted commas, getting away with playing him, you've got to give him, you know, a, a good 10 games just to just for his development and for the, for the future of the side. Yep, I agree 100%. He hasn't done anything wrong as far as I'm concerned. No. Uh, you know, and, and and the whole thing is, is that I, I mean, I'm, I strongly believe that Jenkins will come back into the side, um, and um, but uh, you know, because him will be, you know, it's a tough position, it's a tough role, and he will he'll need he'll need a spell at at some point. And um, he's only twenty years old, and I think that if you look at if you want to do a comparison and you look at someone like Harry Mackay at Carlton, in his he's one year ahead of Elliot, and um, Harry in his third year. Um, Played 13 games. Um, in his second year, he played one game, exactly the same as Elliot. The first year, he played no games, exactly the same as Elliot. So they're tracking similar if Elliot can, you know, get 10 or 11 games. And then, of course, in his fourth year now, you're seeing the benefit of getting those, pumping those games into McKay. Mm. You, you, you've got to pump some games into him now while you've got him there and while he's, you know, um, while he's filling a role. Um, and, you know, even if it's just eight to ten games, you've got to get those games into him this year and then have him ready for uh, for a fuller season next year. It's and, only 20. And when he's got some confidence up too. So, mm. you know, he's it's not like he's struggling through these. He's actually doing some pretty good things and getting himself in the right positions. And, you, you know, you want you want people to be feeling good while they're doing it out there because you want to make that the habit of how they play. And, yep. um, and I think, you know, at this stage, we are looking – um, a thirty percent better side um, with with him in and Jenkins out. I just don't think you make that change. Yeah. No. I, look, there's no doubt in my mind that Joshua will come back. He will be. Um, he, you know, he'll end up. If we have a run into finals, it'll be Jenkins that'll be um, taking that role. And, I'm not hundred percent um, sure about that, Pete. Because you don't think? You, well, you can. Well, I mean, history tells you yes, absolutely that that's what the Crows will do. Uh, probably sooner rather than later. Um, but if Josh keeps conducting himself the way that he is currently conducting himself, I could see them basically uh, saying, well, maybe when Elliot needs a spell, we might actually chuck Darcy up there. Mm. I, I don't think I don't think it's as cut, a, cut and dried for JJ as, as uh, what he probably thinks it is. Because let's face it, his, his output was atrocious. And our form turnaround mm. has coincided with him not being in the team. Well, I think Taylor Walker was quoted through the week as saying that um, he certainly he has certainly appreciated the um, the um, Elliot's leading patterns, mm. um, and uh, I think that um, you know I saw some reports from people who were at the game and, and said that you know there were a couple of times where you know Elliot was leading and he, he could sense that he was in Walker's space and he'd immediately get out and he just seemed to know he just it was just a you know instinctively knew the spots and and I, and I thought this was the case against Gold Coast that he just has a good football brain and he yeah. just seems to know and and then once he go once he gets on his bike and then takes rolls back towards the goal square and then leads back out again with that space that's created I mean it's that you know I mean I think that Tex probably helped Joshy out a bit today in his presser when he when he when he said that um it's it, it's the fact that he's been going back and you know practicing his jumping at the ball I think that was a bit lame to be honest um it's the fact that he's now got some space and he's leading from the goal square and he's playing more like a true full forward than he yeah. is a centre half forward, where he was further up the ground. I just don't think the game suited him. Yeah, I agree. Be interesting to see how that plays out, Peter. Yep. So yeah. that will uh, we'll we'll push on from that one. Yeah. Um, Lukey, Lukey Brown was good. The good news story of the week, I thought. Um, he's been um, posted as being un, uh, as being available now for yeah. SNFL duties on the weekend. So it will be great to see Luke Brown back. They need him desperately back there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, 
nothing much happening around the um, uh, the tribunal. That's normally our great source. I, 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 there was a little bit of a ripple um, through the week uh, from the umpires who were, and this is a, a topic that we talked about last week, the fact that the umpires, um, I think, felt a bit dirty at the AFL, that um, they pretty much left them to hang out to dry after the Anzac Day game. Uh, yeah. when there was a massive criticism of the umpires during uh, that game. And I think that um, Sean Ryan came out of his own bat to uh, ex- explain four or five of the decisions and and uh, and tick them off. Um, but uh, there were certainly some reports floating around. And, you know, it's really, really, um, you know, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect there. And, you know, it just shows, to me, it just shows, again, you know, the AFL lip service, we're hocking, you know, f- puts out an article last week saying that, you know, they want to, do some work with the umpires and they're not appreciated and you know, blah, blah, blah. And and then when uh, when they are under siege, the AFL is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know, the, the umpires uh, apparently were none too pleased about that. Yeah, I heard, I heard something somewhere uh, that the umpires actually aren't full-time. I thought they were full-time, but uh, AFL no. umpires aren't full-time. No, they're not. Thought- they get played pretty well, though. Yeah, I just would have thought that, uh, you know, for the elite sporting competition, you know, that you're only going to use a certain amount of officials. You have, you'd have them full-time or pretty close too because you could have them doing development stuff in state leagues and all sorts of things. They don't have to be, you know, full-time on the whistle, um, but you'd have them as full-time people that wouldn't be devoted to anything else. Um, we'd, probably, we'd probably lose too many coppers, Donk, if that happened, too many accountants. <laughs> they'd all just <laughs> they'd fall away out of their professions and they'd all be full-time umpires. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> yeah okay um but yeah i just thought that was a bit you know um uh, i thought that was a bit strange i just think that uh something needs to they need to have a good hard look at how they're doing umpiring and interpreting decisions and and if if the entire football community is wrong on when they watch when they watch a game of football and they call it holding, holding the ball then the AFLs need to do some, you know, awareness about what holding the ball actually looks like nowadays, and you know, and what some of these things actually look like. Because uh, some of those calls that I saw over the weekend, not just not just Anzac Day game, but there was a heap during our game as well that I was literally going, "This is amateur stuff. Like this is amateur hour stuff." Uh, I think it was a holding the ball um, uh, with about ten sec- in about with about five minutes in the first quarter against St Kilda, and I was. Um, screaming my head off and it was amateur hour stuff and then yeah so I just think there needs to be a whole look at how they're doing it because I just don't think it's right Donk it's never going to happen like because we've been saying it's amateur and I don't disagree with anything you've said it's been amateur hour for bloody years and years and years there's no there's no um, there's no benefit to to them doing that What's the, what's the benefit for them stopping a conversation week in, week out? Oh, look, you know, they've got, they've got, um, they want to keep their brand strong. And if it is, they, I, I've noticed in the last few weeks, a, apart from the normal noise about umpiring that's been happening, I've noticed a, a definite increase in the intensity on the criticism of individual decisions that I haven't heard, that I don't think I've heard for a long time. Mm. I just don't think that they uh, they would care enough to actually do anything tangible with the umpires. I think it creates conversation. We know that the AFL enjoy having conversations, uh, you know, to fill up the media and all the rest of it. I don't think this is any different, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you say, don't get me wrong. Um, but um, I couldn't agree with you more, actually. No, <laughs> but I just Makes don't sense. see. It. I just don't see it happening. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. What do we think of uh, Rewalt's um, Rewalt's chicken wing tackle? Oh, look, I don't. They're just handing out fines for the sake of fines. I think, don't you? No, I think he hyperextended and pulled it backwards more than he needed to. I think he's a grub. I have to say, I was surprised he didn't get a game for that. Really? Mm. Oh, I didn't. I don't mind the holding the arm, the holding the arm part of the tackle because you want to hold it away. But he he pushes down, rolls back, and then pulls the arm up, and then pulls it up again. He does a double pump of the arm up and away. A double like, pump. It's just, yeah, he, he double pumped him on the ground <laughs> while lying on top of him. 
Right. Well, you can't have that. No, nah, this you can't have it's that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Look, I don't know. I just think we're all a bit precious about that sort of stuff, aren't we? Aren't we? Really? Uh, I, I, I don't think there's anything in what he did except for an intent to hurt. He laid a really good tackle, got the hole in the ball, and he... And there was the, you know how we used to talk about the dangerous tackle and if there was a second movement, then it was what the deliberate part was. So you could tackle him, but it was a second movement driving the ground. Yeah. He did a second and third movement on the chicken wing tackle. And I was, I've actually come across this from, from a point of view of like, yeah, tackle's tackle. We've got to grab the arm. That's fine. But mm. it's the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the extra things that he did was, was grub like. It was grub behavior. Okay. Well, anyway, who cares? Jack Rewalt. Um, Poor old Paddy McCartan. They reckon he might be out for the season now, Pete. Surely this is going to come to a head soon. Boom-tish. No pun intended there, I'm sure, but it's no. um, it's a really, really, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult situation. And uh, you're right. I think it will come to a head soon. And um, uh, you know, the, the AFL will just be batting down the hatches and, and waiting waiting for it to arrive because, um, yeah. Um, Paddy McCartan, classic case, and he he shouldn't be. Yeah, you know, I mean, surely his family are talking to him. He shouldn't be playing football again. No, well that's right. I mean, if you're going to have twelve months out of the game, that doesn't. All, I mean, I know we can come back from you know joint injuries or muscular injuries or whatever, but geez, concussion. I don't know. Anyway, and of course we've got the the John Barnes issue that's sort of waiting in the wings uh, that we've discussed previously as well, and that's I think going to be the one that. Uh, kicks it all off so uh yeah not good times not good times at all um not much else happening in the news though gents so do we want to get straight into the uh into the match itself and have a chat about that yeah let's do that you guys can have a have a say because i had a big say on sunday well i guess the first thing that i would say is that um uh, I, I had a feeling that we um, we were we were looking fairly set at um, at being competitive at the contest. We had um, Cam and Hugh Greenwood, the Crouches and, and Sloaney, and so my concern was that we'd lost a little bit of outside with some of the injuries that we've got, and um, uh, and the fact that um, St Kilda had been you know much touted as the fittest side of the competition and for a very hard running side. And so I know at the start of the game. Um, I put up something in social media, and I said, "I think that if we're any if we're any chance to win this game, uh, I put that uh, we needed ninety possessions out of um, all of Smith, uh, Atkins, McKay, and Knight. I thought we needed ninety possessions out of those four guys." And um, to my complete astonishment, when I looked at the stats afterwards, we had Brody Smith with thirty possessions, Rory Atkins with twenty-seven. DMAC with uh, 18 and Riley Knight was uh, 15. So we had a perfect 90 possessions out of those four guys. <laughs> um, and so, so I think that that just, um, whilst um, none of those guys were in the, in the coaches votes or anything like that, I think that they, um, they at least um, gave us that, um, that little bit of outside movement, um, which uh, complemented the big guys when they started to get on top inside um, about halfway through the uh, the first quarter. But what I really want to um, focus on is the defence. I thought the defence was absolutely amazing. The the structure was, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult to see it, isn't it, when you're on you know TV because you just it just pops up when the when the camera goes uh, goes to that end. And just every time the camera went down, you know, you would look down at our defence. Everyone was perfectly positioned. To um, I don't know whether it was just St Kilda's bad delivery or was it, I you know, couldn't really tell how we'd set up, but um, um, you know the structure to the, to the eye watching on TV was absolutely perfect. And so, congratulations to Marty Matner there for the um, for the way he had everybody structured up because I think that we were all a bit concerned that we might be a bit slow in defence and um, that we a had bit, a bit, yeah, uh, just a, a bit few tall, big guys there. More than, more than slow. Yeah, Pardo I think, and that I think still yeah, you're quick, right. But it, I, yeah, my, you're right. My fear was that we were just going to be a bit tall and be, be found mm. out at ground level. Um, but it uh, wasn't the case, and, uh, and, and those guys, uh, once they settled down after that first 10 or 15 minutes, they were, they were fantastic. So, um, so congratulations to the defence as a whole, and it was great to see 
I don't know if you saw the uh, Instagram photo of the uh, the Brotherhood, the Defence Brotherhood, all round at Tom Dido's place for a uh, yeah, for that. a get together. It was a it was a fantastic photo and um, um, and, and and good on them. It was great to see Lockie Scholl there in his uh, in his footy socks. <laughs> so, <laughs> very, very funny, um, but uh, no, terrific to see um, um, the older blokes um, ushering in those because uh, we've got a number of new defenders. Um, uh, with us in the sand floor and they, they, they look like they're great pickups and it's good to see that that, that, that yeah. bond is being formed. So anyway, well done to the defence. I thought they were great. Um, uh, to me, Alex Keith and Taylor Walker were both um, standouts. I actually had my 3-2-1 as Keith, Smith and um, and Walker and I was really surprised that Smith didn't get in the coaches' votes and I know that I sometimes uh, like to pour a bucket on Brody, um, but he's he, he just makes such a difference to our side when he's up and going and how... He couldn't get into the coaches' votes with 30 possessions and 700 and just under 750 metres gained is uh, yeah, a, a little bit of a surprise to me. A bit surprising. Uh, I, I thought he was just fantastic. He, some of his uh, penetration and um, with his kick and he, he was terrific. Text of course with his four goals and just presented. He's on a new lease of life and and uh, we talked earlier about the space that he's now getting um, through the forward line and. Um, uh, just you know, it just presents a really, really big, big target. And you know, that's always been Texas' strength. He's never been a um, contested marking player. He's just been a great lead-up player. And you know, there's few better in the competition that lead as well as what ten times his leads as well as he does. And so, when he's got the space and and the delivery, and uh, you know, he's unstoppable really. Um, and you give him something around about 40, 50 meters, and that's just a chip for him. It's just a nine-nine, and um, and uh, away we go. So, those guys were great. I thought that. Um, Sorry, Donk, I'll, I'll, t- I'll take a breath and I'll, I'll give you a go in a minute. Um, Pete's on a mission. He, he, you've I'm got a, an early bedtime tonight, mate. <laughs> um, Brad it's Crouch, a conversational a of, show, mate. Just, you he know. was fantastic, Brad Crouch, at the contest. But, geez, he was, uh, you know, uh, his decision-making when uh, when he's out in the open really leaves a bit to be desired. Some of the decisions he made and some of his disposal <clears throat> by foot was pretty ordinary. Um, but, uh, anyway, he was great at the contest and... Um, and deserved his votes. Uh, anyway, that's uh, some thoughts for me, Donk. Uh, Sorry, yeah, no, you're right. I um, I um, I was thinking maybe more about a momentum and a pacing sort of thing of the game. Um, I noticed that we we seem to be very slow out of the blocks whenever we're playing. Um, and I think this has happened a few weeks in a row now. So uh, our our first quarters always seem to be have seemed to be very slow for a few years now, but. Um, I think we won on Saturday um, through a little bit of luck of St Kilda not kicking away too far. Um, you know, if Jack Stevens had put away that one from about 20 metres out um, and a couple of more, then we might have been in a little bit more trouble. We were um, very lucky that they weren't a few in front, Donk. And, um, uh, and I thought that we looked a little bit disorganised through the middle um, and, uh, and I thought uh, and, and that, that showed with the ball coming in too fast into defence early on. Um, and that's why we copped a, copped a few of those goals. I'd actually don't play, put it on the defence, but the ball was just coming straight back in at a million miles an hour, and you can't do too much for that. Um, but uh, um, all in all, um, I spoke last week about um, how we're not very good playing the game when it's not being played on our terms. And I think the last two weeks have shown we've gotten a bit of involved in a bit of a, an arm wrestle, um, and that we've um, arm wrestled the game back onto our terms. So. Um, uh, well, I think that that's a really positive sign. We found a way to win, and we've 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 managed to slow the game up and and get it turned away from not being played on our terms. Which is usually if it's not being played our way, then it's not being played at all. So I think that was some really good stuff and some really positive signs. Uh, and I just really wish that Don Pike had worked out that he could walk down to the bench um, in September in 2017 because uh, it seems to be working a trick. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting one, that one. I, I felt that the momentum swung after our first rotations. Uh, uh, it didn't seem to be clicking uh, with the Crouch boys and Sloney uh, first up, but when Hugh and uh, uh, CY went into the middle, uh, and that coincided, I think, with Pikey coming down on the bench and having a chat with our first rotation mids, I think, and uh, there was just some subtle changes and a lift in intensity, uh, and away we went. So... I, there's certainly value with uh, with uh, Pikey coming down to the bench. I don't I don't think there's any coincidence, do you? 
No, I think the stink iron just making people focus and think about what they're doing. So against Hawthorne, um, um, watching that game, I thought one of our biggest problems we have, and I don't necessarily put it all down to structure, I just put it down to our skill level was quite abhorrent. And um, and it looked like we were we were going to break out a few times and do some really great things, but we'd butcher the ball and we'd go down a hawk's player's throat or come off the side of the boot at you know a forty five degree angle and run it on the ground. And we saw a lot of that sort of stuff early on against them. Uh, I didn't get to see too much of the Geelong game, but um, uh, so I can't make too much comment on that. But uh, I did notice the same sort of not quite clicking um, at the start of the North Melbourne game. The reason. The North Melbourne game broke my heart. Was in the second half. It wasn't. It wasn't a clicking. It looked like we were lost and we didn't know what we were doing um, against you know North Melbourne, who were a bottom feeder, and uh, uh, that was something that was really disturbing. But the last couple of weeks, it's come back to: uh, Are we going to click in the first quarter? And we have clicked, and we've um, we've moved on through. So I'm I'm pretty happy. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not um, the lid's not entirely off yet, but uh, I've definitely loosened it. Oh, it can't be anywhere near off, surely. Oh, you don't know. You don't know the the love the lovely land that I live in. <laughs> look, oh, look, look, look my, my baseline is yeah. I was going to say my baseline is we were a side with basically the same with the same uh, you know skeleton of a side mm. that made a grand final a couple of years ago. We didn't make that off of one finals appearance like 2012. We made that by building up um, yeah. over a three or four year period. And a nice we got to a point where we really good. Yeah, well. No, we didn't have a soft fixture in 2017. Yes, we, we did. We finished pretty high. We, nah, we, 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 we were six. We had a very soft fixture in 2017. Mm, I, yeah, I don't... Yeah, we did. To agree to we, had the middle, we had the middle rung. We didn't have the soft rung. We had the middle rung. Yeah, um, yeah very uh, easy rung. Anyway, yeah, no. but anyway, we, I think that we, um, we did the things that we needed to do and we built up to the point where we got to. So I don't think... It's not one of those times where you sort of peak up high and then fall away. We... We rode to the top of the mountain, um, and then we've fallen down a cliff a bit. Now, did we fall off the cliff, or did we roll down, you know, 20, 30 metres? And I, I think we're at the point right now of uh, do we reclimb or do we disintegrate? And I think the next couple of weeks are, are you vital. You're smashing this analogy, absolutely hammering it for all yeah. it's worth. <laughs> Look, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you reckon there's? Do you reckon there's a coincidence, uh, a correlation between uh, coaches starting to coach from the bench and the lack of runners? Because when I said at the beginning of the year that I reckon that it was going to be a big deal having no runners, you all said, "No, nah, you're an idiot." But now we've got all these coaches coming down on the bench. Oh, I think there has to be a correlation, doesn't there? Well, it seems um, that way. It seems that way for the Crows, anyway. It seems that, uh, like you said, Don, we do start a bit slow. I thought we might have started slow because we were a bit chuffed with having a 70 point win the week before which is a trap that we often fall into and our, our intensity uh, isn't quite where it needs to be at the beginning of the game but uh, there, there seems to be um, I think it's it's a, an issue that has come to light slowly and gradually but uh, what probably about 30% of the coaches now coaching from the bench? Look, it was a trend that started a couple of years ago, and then seemed to disappear. Um, you know, I've, 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 you know, come from a basketball background um, a lot as a kid, and um, you know, and, and and did a fair bit of youth coaching and that sort of stuff as well. And one of the things um, that you that you miss by sitting in the box, sure, you might get all the analysis and that might be in front of you, but you um, the ability to rev up a player and and go through them. You know, sitting next to them, I think there's there's just something about that. So you know, I, this might be a long term trend that moves. What do you reckon, Pete? Yeah, look, I think that the um, the the correlation is is clearly there, and I think that um, uh, I mean, you know, that the the runner still sits down there on the bench, but uh, for whatever reason, I, it, it, and obviously we're on the on the inside, but um, you can only draw a conclusion. That the fact that those um, that we that they're not getting the messages to the players out on the ground um, it means that um, you know uh, the coaches are looking to get down on the bench at ground level. And maybe they're yelling out. Maybe they're you know I don't know. Um, but um, there's certainly a correlation there, no question about it. And um, I, I'm not sure that there 
um, I'd, draw, I'd go as far as drawing the correlation of the fact that the coach on the bench that suddenly were having success. I think there's you know, probably a bit more to it than that. Um, but um, we'll certainly see over the next couple of weeks anyway, because I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, look, you can only beat who's in front of you. And St Kilda were, after what, five or six rounds, they were top. Um, so, you know, they were a, a team that was, you know, that was in good form and you can only beat them, you know, and it's an away win as well. So it was, a, you know, it was full of merit, um, the win, no question about it. But um, when you looked at that fixture before the start of the season, that is a game you would have expected to bank. If you, you know, if you are feeling about, about being a, you know, even a top eight side, you, you would look at that and think, right, we've got to bank that win. So, so we have, and you know, we've got to make, we've, we've got to really get up some ground because you know the way that things are looking, most sides are probably going to beat North, uh, and that was a game that you know, that we dropped. So we've got to really, you know, make something of the next two or three weeks while we're on a bit of a run of form. Yep, couldn't agree more. <laughs> Drink up. All right, we've got to lift the intensity ourselves here tonight, boys. So uh, uh, I reckon uh, one of the things that uh, I'm still querying is the fact that the last two weeks we've pretty much had had uh, the red carpet rolled out to us through the corridor. You know, it's there hasn't been a lot of resistance on transition, and I think that's made us look pretty damn good uh, running, you know, running offensively. But I mentioned this on Sunday, and I and I hold I stick to it. I, I'm not convinced until we actually play a team that uh, is trying to stop us from playing the way we want to play. Uh, you know, aka Hawthorne or Geelong, a team that is actually organised offensively. Yeah, look, I there's something I'd like to do a bit of. De- I, I remember hearing you say that on Sunday night. There's something that I'm. Thanks for listening. That I, yeah, no, it was. Um, I was doing the dishes and uh, nothing else to do. So um, um, listen to you made me, um, you know, it was instead of going to mass. But um, we, uh, uh, you've got to, uh, you, I don't know whether it's just the red car that's been rocked out or we're actually doing some things differently to be able to move the ball the way we want to move it through the middle and whether we're giving more, where we're giving ourselves more options and we're actually hitting more targets by hand and foot. Like, I don't, th- I think you can't discount how bad our, you know, transition disposal have been on some points where, you know, it looked like we were getting it, um, we were being stopped through smart play, but it was actually just we weren't doing the things we needed to do to be able to move the ball. Yeah, I don't know. What do you reckon, Pete? Oh, I think I think a lot of it comes down to um, you know to personnel and 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 the fact that um, you know really for me the, the the last two wins have been a lot about Brody Smith, um, and I just think that the, his importance when he's up and running is you know just can't be downplayed because he, you know he's he's the guy that you know gives that bounce off half back and, and you know you know. Runs with the runs and carries, and then also he'll you know he'll kick the ball. You know, I mean, the kick that he he gave to Tex um, in the second quarter was you know, I mean, there's not many guys, not a lot of guys can you know kick a 60 meter dart like that and hit hit a guy in the chest running back. I mean, you know, um, so the fact that Brody's been released a little bit further up the ground, he seems yeah. to be playing a little bit forward of half back. Yeah. And I, th- I think that when you're, when you're talking about our transition through the middle of the ground, as you, as you say, because if you look at the rest of our midfield, and this probably goes back to what I was trying to say earlier with the 90 possessions, when you look at our midfield, it's a very, very um, work, it is actually a very workmanlike um, midfield. It's, it's not a, it's not a you know, massive metres gained midfield you know you, when you're talking about the crouches and sloney and yeah, those guys right. great at the cold face i mean you know guys that you'd go to war with um uh and 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 that win the contested ball but when you're looking at actually transitioning the ball you know you and, and i thought that rory atkins had a really good game um on um on saturday as well with it you know he got it 27 times and he he just got the ball moving through that that middle area of the ground Doesn't and so no, I know he doesn't. I, I know not, he doesn't. Not I know until he does it in a pressure game. It doesn't impress yep. me. No, I, no, absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that point. Um, uh, so, yeah, catching. So, but just looking at the games and where the improvements come from, I guess, and, and, and further to your point of the fact that we've been, you know, gifted the middle, I, I think it had, does have something to do with the fact that we've had, a, you know, a few players, particularly Brody, that has come, that have, you know, have been released to try and, you know, make that transition or play. Now, yeah. 
if they get to a point where, you know, as happened when he has had other good seasons and someone sits on him, I think that'll be a really big, um, that, that, that'll be a, a conundrum for us. And I, you know, you know where I sit with this squad, Fino. Yep. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind that you're correct in that, you know, they've got to prove themselves against opposition who are notoriously capable of taking away our strengths. Yeah. I think Fremantle will be a good test on Sunday. I watched them on the weekend and I, I thought that they were, you know, they, they played reasonably well and they're actually a reasonably, you know, good football side at the moment. And I, I think that we should be able to overcome them. But similar to St Kilda, I think that they'll be a good stepping stone kind of a game. Yeah. Um, and then and then we'll we'll crack into Port Adelaide the next week, which will be um, a huge test because they will be difficult to beat. Yeah. Uh, I, I, the couple of things that I've noticed, Pete, I reckon. I, Carrying on from your points, um, I reckon our defence looks a little bit more set now. I don't think we we come up as high as what we have done the first couple of weeks, and also I don't think we actually um, I don't think we're sending as many players forward of the ball, if you know what I mean. So mm. we're not getting caught on defensive transition so much because every bugger, every man and his dogs, you know, forward or centre, we're actually only committing a. a like the blokes that aren't involved in the passage of play are still kind of hanging back a little bit. So um, I reckon that's helped. And I don't think our our defensive back or our back six have pushed up as high um, as perhaps was in the first couple of weeks. But I don't. we've had no pressure on, on, on turnover. We've had no pressure. Both, both the last couple of games we've played teams that are very honest, very hard working around, around the clearances and around the contested ball and on both occasions early um, particularly with the St Kilda game they, they had us on toast in terms of clearance mm. numbers and contested ball numbers and it wasn't until as I said that first rotation happened and our intensity lifted that we were able to get back level pegging but neither of, neither of those two sides Gold Coast and St Kilda were going to stick with us once we actually started winning the ball at Coalface because we they weren't. They weren't going to be able to cover us uh, defensively, and that's that's how it panned out. As soon as we were able to win contested ball and clearance numbers, I mean, what do we have like a a twelve straight clearance stat from halfway through the second quarter or something or other? Yeah, well, we were we were, we were well behind in the stat yeah. at quarter time. Yeah. We were behind in everything. It was it was a remarkable looking through the stats at quarter time, and we were behind in everything. Yep, and you know. Being able to being able to do something about the those cold face numbers, I think, was that was the key because we were always going to do them on the outside because they just didn't have enough pace to go with us. And I don't, Cam and I on Thursday night on the rev up show that didn't get published until after the game because my PC is a heap of shit. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we both said that uh, you know the match up for them. Uh, trying to cover us defensively was going to be difficult, and that's the way it panned out. Because the actual forward fifty entries number wasn't all that. I think it was forty seven to fifty two. Um, but we we uh, made far more use of the forward fifty entries that we had compared to them. Uh, I think the special notice has to be put on how uh, accurate we were until three quarter time or until third quarter um, uh, as well. And just sorry, you're just picking up on your forward entry stat. Um, we uh, we were very uh, we were very accurate and very efficient in terms of uh, not wasting our shots, which is something that hasn't been a highlight of our 2019 campaign. No, there were some good signs there, and um, and I think that Freo, as I said, will, will present a good challenge. Uh, gents, how do you see selection panning out? Um, I, I know I had a pretty good look at the uh, the sandfall um, on the weekend, and um, there were some excellent performances again from from the sample team. They they, they comfortably defeated Centrals out there at the Ponderosa, and and um, Nettie McHenry was was very very good. Um, he was just uh, his running power is something pretty special when you think that he was playing out there on that huge ground. And um, the, I would like to know the amount of kilometres because he looked like he was playing midfield pretty much all the game and his capacity to get up and down the ground was really quite astonishing. He was amazing. So he's um, he's very, very good. This uh, Obviously, uh, Josh Jenkins will be in the frame and as much as we don't want him to be, I think that we wouldn't be being realistic if we said that he wasn't in the frame. Um so I think McHenry is probably the, the main one at the moment pushing up. But I think that, uh, of course, Bryce Gibbs 
will need to come back into that side, I suspect. And so you'd probably have to say that after a good win like that, um, conservatively, conservatively, just the one change, which I think you'd be looking at either uh, Galucci or Paholke uh, coming out for Gibbs. Yeah, uh, I, I think you might be right. Um, I think, I think, uh, even though Palky was a little bit better than he has been in some weeks, I, I, I think we look better with Galucci in the side just for his pace. I think, I think we, I think we're just a bit slow in that midfield, and I think we need to have um, some faster guys as much as we can. So, uh, swap out Galucci for Gibbs. I think would be um, uh, would be double double directions in the wrong direction, if you know what I mean. Um, so I'm really hoping it's just uh, the Pahoki and Gibbs stuff. Um, but uh, are we uh, are we uh, afraid of waking someone up at the moment? It's like you guys are singing no. a lullaby. Come on, fire up! Oh, so we're just having we're just having rational adult discussion. Yeah, yeah I know, sorry. but we're trying to put on a podcast. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, this is this is this is Professor Donkey <laughs> coming across yeah, today. Right. Well, look, I want to sack Jack Kelly, and and I want to bring in Debbie Kendry to play in the back pocket. Can we do that? Well, it might be a bit late. I don't mind the I don't mind the idea, Donk. But uh, Lukey Brown, probably a week or two away. Um, yeah, he'll play. He'll play SNFL. Yeah, I, I don't. I've. Jeez, I don't know. I, I just don't want Kelly in the team. I, I was saying, on, I put to Macker on Sunday that uh, how do we know what our best 22 is if we don't try some of these lads? And, you know, we've got Darcy in the twos, we've got Benny Davis in the twos, we've got Shoal putting his hand up, we've got Ned putting his hand up. Chase Jones didn't get a run even though he hadn't done anything wrong. We got we got some... Blo- I really want to see us actually, you know, rotate some blokes through the squad this year so that we can get to the pointy end with a fair idea of what our actual best 22 is. Not the best 22 based on who got picked last week. Yeah. It's really hard, though, Fane, because you just know that they that, that, um, that the mantra for so many years now has been continuity. And, you know, you think that, you know, we think that we've got, you know, Richard Douglas, they'll, they'll want to put Dougie back in this side as well. You know, so... Um, it's going to be hard for those guys um, to break in, I reckon, um, unfortunately. And you know that I'm a G for, for for kids like you know Ben Davis and Lockie Scholl and these kind of kids who just week after week are just putting in performances. Um, mm. It's it, it, I just think honestly, I reckon they've probably the, the club probably been taken by surprise because they would have sat back, uh, they would have been thinking right up to round one, they would have been thinking. You know, um, we've got we've got the band back together. We've got we haven't got many injuries. Uh, we've got you know we've got all the, we've got players back. We're set for a really good crack at it this year. We've got a lot you know young kids that can just you know um, um, percolate away in the twos and, um, and and away we go. All of a sudden, you know, we just you know we just fell into a hole, and you've got senior players underperforming, and you know a couple of injuries. And then you've got all these kids that are just tearing up the SNFL. Yeah. I mean, Lockie Shoal just, he just makes it look, I mean, have you seen him play live? Not live, but have you seen, oh, I mean, I'm I've only seen him on the, yeah. yeah. I mean, he just, his disposal is just, it's elite I'm off both feet. Yeah. You know, he's such a good footballer, you know, and, and Benny Davis, I mean, you know, 20 possessions, two goals, you know, six marks. And he's just, you know, drifting around, you know, he's playing on the wing and then and rotating um, down to the forward line as well. So he's getting a, you know, he's got a decent tank on him now. And some of his some of his shows of strength on the weekend where he was just shaking players off, he's becoming a real, you know, a really, really solid, yeah. strong unit. And, um, you know, to be playing that role and get 20 and two goals is a, is a, is a strong effort. Yep. So absolutely. you just got the and that they just week in week out they they make a case and McHenry twenty eight possessions eleven tackles if you don't mind now That's I the think thing that, with McHenry well, why I don't understand why we didn't just stick him in Brownie spot from the beginning because we could see through JLT that it was going to give us something defensively. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, look, I think that he needs to um, work a little bit on his hurt factor with his kicking. Um, he tends to favour the you know the twenty metre dink sort of kick, but mm. that's okay. He'll he'll um, I mean you know he's only eighteen years old, and um, but it, it's just his running power, his mm. running power, and and his ability to get from contest to contest. 
and to uh, and to tackle and to you know force contest to force a ball up to do whatever has got to be done. Um, yeah. He just is the kind of player that would just annoy the shit out. Of him yeah, look, I think if, if, if you're opposition, I I am um, I I tend to um, I tend to think that um, David McKay, Hardigan, and and Kelly won't be part of uh, part of our team. You know, when it's really up and firing, successful, I just don't know that they've got the they've got the finesse to be that next part of that next that next phase. Um, but I think McHenry uh, definitely could be part of the next next phase. And even though McKay's putting in some really solid performances over the last few weeks, like playing for career or, or a new contract again, um, I I just think that putting McHenry in in his spot or in someone's spot is going to give us a little bit more right now, or at least show us what we could be getting. That, that's the key. Not... That's the key, Don. You know, you don't know what you've got until you have a look. And we know exactly what we're going to get from D Mac. We know what we're going to get from Rat. We know what we're get, going to get from Smithers, uh, from Jake Kelly, from like all these blokes. We know what they've got to give us. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a, a spike in improvement there. There'll, there'll be natural progression, but there's no spike in improvement. We don't know whether they're best twenty-two because we don't know what their potential replacements can offer. And you know we fall, we fall into this trap every season where we we settle on a best twenty two and it's just you know the standard conservative ins and outs that are forced, and we don't actually flip our our squad over a little bit, and so we get to finals we don't a a the the twenty two that we've favoured all season are cooked, and b we have no idea what the replacements can do, and c we haven't put any experience into those replacements so they're all a bit you know shell shocked when they're thrown onto the onto the big stage. It's very poor squad management in my in my opinion. Yep. Oh absolutely no question. And look the reality is is that they don't they would they won't drop D Mac when he's playing badly. So they're not they're certainly not gonna drop him when he, you know, picks up uh, his uh, amazing twenty three possessions against the Gold Coast Suns at home in a seventy three point win. Um so, you know, they're just not gonna change for anything. You know, I mean, I I banged on about this, you know, about three or four weeks ago that that we had fifteen players from our twenty fifteen semi final losing side. Yeah, and it's, we know what we're going to get from them. Well, we do because we've had them for the, we've had them for five for four years. Yeah, and yeah. we've and you know we've, and how many you know we've seen in big games. We we know the players that disappear. And look, I know that there's, 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 you know, you, you never know what the injury situation is, what niggles blokes are carrying, and all that sort of stuff. But we've had a fair look at this squad. You know, 2015, the majority of the squad has been together, like you said, Pete. We, what, we, we may as well not have drafted in that time. You know, what's the point? You, surely mm. you are trying to improve your best 22 every time you go to the draft table or every time you go to the trade table. And yes, there's a couple of blokes that we've brought in out of trades like Seed, etc., who who've added to the team. But we've got these kids, and we've we've brought them in into a squad where there's probably a a, a group of seven or eight players who are really borderline. I mean, don't forget we've got Richie Douglas, uh, who will come back. Now, what's going to happen with Richie? Is he going to come straight back into the twenty-two? You know, and oh, you you would, th- it- but you would think based on what Adelaide normally do, that he will, Pete. Yeah, he definitely will. It, it, all it will be for Rich is it, it, it'll be is you know how many sample games does he play? Yeah, yeah. One or maybe maybe two at the most. Yeah, and, and, it's, and he's straight in. Yeah, and that's that's poor because he'll come in in the place of a kid. And yeah. do I mean all things being equal, Pete and Donk? Do you reckon we'd be a better t- a better team at the moment with uh, Shoal in instead of Jake Kelly? I might not have him in for Jake Kelly just for the fact that Jake's just just that bit stronger, um, um, and a bit a bit a bit heavier body. I think um, Lockie's what about obviously Darcy then, but definitely Darcy Fogarty. Yeah, and I'd and I'd, and I'd have I'd have Shoal in front of McKay. Yeah, absolutely. They're, yeah. they're the two changes that I think are glaringly obvious. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And the other thing too is the uh, the last couple of premiership winners um, have all played a few kids throughout the year, like they've. Yeah. They've all exactly. actually changed their arm. Like West Coast's forward line at the start of last year, um, and, you know, all, all of their small forwards were hadn't played a game before, and they were guys that went through and won grand final. So um, Richmond were the same, and, and, you know, the Western Bulldogs story is based off youth. So this is uh, where 
we're too conservative and we're just and you know we bang on about the same stuff all the time but it's just it's just glaring and hurting i don't, I, don't oh, even, they... I wouldn't even call it a conservative anymore i'd actually call it unprofessional because we there's enough examples around different sports around the globe that that run playing squads um that have drafts and all that sort of stuff there's enough evidence to suggest that you need to turn your your squad over. You need to pick games where it's good to give young players experience, etc., etc., etc. You know, be creative about the looks. I mean, I don't know why we're playing three tools at the moment. You know, Hardigan could definitely come out for a mid or a small. You know, against St Kilda, we would sadly mismatch. And yes, it didn't hurt us in the end, but it definitely could have if, if St Kilda got more service into that forward line. And I just don't think it's conservatism I think it's actually a lack of creativity and professionalism not to give these kids a go because we just we like we mentioned about Harry Deer last week Pete it's just wasted opportunity wasted talent we never we will never know what Harry Deer could have done no that's right um and um you know I if you can look at um, all the, you know, the number of the guys that were drafted after Jordy Colucci in 2016, and they're up to about 40 games. Yeah, you know, Jordy's stuck on 15 or 16. Yeah, and and um, that's through a period of Bradley Crouch not being available. Yeah. Yep. You know, so we stuck with Richard Douglas at the expense of Jordan Colucci, a first round pick, when Richie Douglas was stinking it up week in week out. Rory Atkins was having a mare of a season, and Jordan Colucci couldn't get a run. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that, that's the thing that worries me. And I, look, we sort of, I guess, veered off the topic of the of the match at hand. But I just, I find it difficult to get excited about these games because I want to see a body of work that includes creativity from the coaches, uh, good squad management, um, the players standing up under real pressure against teams that we don't like playing against and that make it difficult for us to play against. Um, so one, uh, what do they say? One swallow doesn't make a spring. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And um, as I say, really, these games against St Kilda and Frio are just, you know, good stepping stones because they're good enough sides that they're not, you know, they're not rubbish um, at all. Um, they're competitive, you know, um, well-drilled teams, but they are teams that we should beat. And um uh, that will um, it will give us a good test. This this will be a really good test on Sunday. Free, I won't be. There'll, there'll be no pushover at all. I don't think. Um, and if we uh, get over the top of them, then uh, we will have uh, done reasonably well and um, gradually build towards having a crack at some of those teams that we really would like to see some wins against. Yeah, the port the port games. Uh, without getting ahead of ourselves, the port games shake me up as a cracker if our form holds. Um, and there is a there is an example of a, a team that's playing kids and reaping the benefits. Yep. Oh, no question. Now, now no you question. Two, Actually, there was. Sorry, go on, Pete. I was just going to say there was a, a stat that came up in the chat from Sensible Crow, and um, just saying that uh, that um, Port have got ten players in, currently in their side from the twenty two that were in round twenty three last year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they've certainly responded to a poor season. Yeah, you yeah, that's the thing. That. They just responded. They just they said enough's enough. Yeah, you, they just you weren't could prepared argue to about, accept. You could argue about how they responded, but that's that's not the point. They actually had a response. Whereas when was the last time we we did something like that? Mm. We had just as bad a season last year. But anyway, I look. I think um, the one thing that I want your opinion on before we move on is uh, I raised on Sunday night is Rosie is the Rosie decision or the 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 decision not to trade up. Uh, to get that pick and get that lad, is that going to come back to bite us in three or four years' time? Oh, look, I'm you know I'm probably the wrong person to ask, Fink, because I'm f- I'm filthy about that trade period last year because I, I still I can't work out how that you know at the at the start of trade period you know we were in a stronger position than what Port were, um, and then by the time the draft came around, they were inside us at every single pick. Yep. Um, and so I was, I was filthy about that. And I was, you know, I always thought, I always thought that Luco and Rankin were out of reach. Um, I, I honestly thought they were out of reach. I didn't think we were ever going to be able to get two yeah. or three uh, off a of Gold Coast. But I always thought that Rosie was gettable. 
um, and um, it just it needed some, you know, there was a lot of talk about, oh, you know, we can't sell the farm. And, um, well, I guess what we're saying now is what the farm will get you. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I can't remember if I said it here on the podcast, but I was certainly um, very, very strong at the time that I was a farm seller because I think that, you know, that those, those players don't come around very often and particularly South Australian players and the fact exactly. that we've been, tra- we'd been tracking those players for three or four years. Yeah. Um, so, yep, I, th- you know, um, it's – Rose is, is the one that almost I think is going to bite us more because, you know, he's a South Australian kid. You're never going to get him out of Port Adelaide now. That's, he's never going to come across the road. You may get Rankin and Luco back. That's possible. Um, but there's no way in the world you get Rosie now. Now that he's gone to port. Yeah, VM says in the chat, you know, hold your fire. Both of our kids have it. That's that's yet to be seen. Uh, Chase Jones looks likely. Ned McHenry looks likely. But they're both very light-bodied midfielders, uh, and the, there's a good chance that neither of them end up making it in the midfield. Rosie is a kind of Rosie is a bona fide midfielder. He will he will play two hundred quality games in the midfield. He, he to me he's Chris Judd like. Yeah, I think he could be anything. He could, like I know that everyone's saying you know, and that's fair enough if you want to say hold your fire. But he is he is projecting as a very very special player. Yeah, uh, it's 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 hard not to be agreeing with Envy right now. Um and uh and. The only the only caveat is is the uh, Sam Powell Pepper and Daniel Rich type where he's going to have a really great first season because he's a bit stronger in the body and then everyone will catch up. So uh, that's the only asterisk I've got on him. But uh, every time I watch him play, I I, I feel a bit sick in the tummy. So yeah, but he hasn't. Got, I mean, I I think the thing with Rosie, he, he's not a big body player. He, he he's just you know has elite skills. He's got elite vision. He's got elite pace. He's just got all of these, you know, exceptional qualities. That um, I understand what you're saying about um, Power Pepper Donk, but I think that you know he was that, um, you know, he had that brute strength, and um, not, not that he's turning out to be such a bad player. Power no. Pepper is, you know, certainly a reasonable footballer, but um, Rosie has these, you know, other, you know, he real, he's a really gifted player. Yeah, both yeah. both um, Power Pepper and um, Ollie were man children. So you yeah, got a media, I, you got a media impact from them, but there, there wasn't a huge upside because basically they were, they were just going to be bulls. You knew they were going to get bulls. I mean, you're never going to see Pal Pepper start being, you know, uh, silky by foot. I mean, he's a bullocker. He'll get the ball forward and he's he'll bullock the ball forward and he'll he'll do a, do a job inside. But kind of rosy, he is an out and out gun. And I, you know, nothing against Chase and, and Ned. But um, I think when we come, to, you know, when we look back on that draft, uh, there'll be a lot of questions asked about why Adelaide didn't go. We had the currency, why we yep. didn't go harder to get Connor Rosie. I really, you know, it blows my mind. Anyway, mm-hmm. look, we can lament that, and uh, kudos to Port. They are playing the kids, and they're getting rewards. Not only Rosie, but Butters, and uh, you know, a couple of others as well. So, uh, Desma, very good play. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, Desma. Cool. Got the rising star nod this week. Yeah, so um, you know, uh, hopefully our club uh, views squad management and list management a little bit more proactively this year. But I guess time will tell. Right, enough of that crap. Let's go into some competitions, donkey, shall we? Yeah, no worries. Let's go. I'm waiting for music. Take it away. All right, we will go with the uh, dream team. So we've got uh, the winter march in. First place, uh, Dillon FCC second, uh, NTFC third, uh, footy and facial hair uh, fourth, the bad men fifth, uh, Game of Thrones sixth, uh, Donkey Magoo's coming in at seventh with three wins, uh, and Mick Spud's rounding out the eight. Um, a couple of interesting features coming up. We're all looking for the battle of the um, the battle of the bottom scrapers in round eighteen when Phoenix flies taking on uh, Venus's Ayatollahs. Uh, we'll flip over to the tipping. Um, my strategy of not putting tips in uh, this week backfired dramatically uh, when I only got four. <laughs> uh, I actually thought about it after the Anzac Day game. I thought, hey, I might just uh, I'll let it go out and see what happens. Wow. Um, 
uh, and uh, got got smacked. So uh, that was that was a bad play. Uh, but we've got DSG uh, in first place with thirty five. Uh, with a big nine for the weekend. Mick Spuds also got nine for the weekend, also on 35. So uh, just a cumulative margin splitting in there. So only six points in cumulative margin are splitting the top two. Uh, Nikki is rounding out uh, rounding out third place. Uh, then we've got Phoenix coming in fourth with 34. Uh, they're both high on 34, those two. Uh, Moyley's uh, on his big charge back up the ranks. He's got a big nine for the weekend. Uh, didn't like the rev up we gave him last week, so he's he's back in the game. Um, and then we go down to Paulie C in six, Bayside Crow seven, Megan V eight, uh, Donkey's at nine, uh, Treeman's at 10, Joel's at 11. J Max still at twelve, uh, but a big eight on the weekend. So uh, he has uh, he's starting to click as well. Uh, Short man thirteen, Orion fourteen, and Matt coming fifteen. So that is where we're sitting at with the competitions this week. Phoenix, back over to you at the desk. Oh, <laughs> I actually am sitting at a desk. All right. Well, look uh, before we go, another big thank you to uh, Ryan at Smith Partners Real Estate and Down to Earth Electrical. Also, uh, thank you to Scorpus. Uh, go check them out at Hardware Unboxed uh, on YouTube. Um, thank you to all our patrons on Patreon. If you want to join us on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast or click the Patreon button on aflcrowcast.com. Just a reminder too that if you uh, if you do feel like venting or writing an article or whatever, um, our website is uh, quite willing to take uh, fan articles. So uh, don't be shy write a few uh, bits and pieces down on paper or you know, on Word or uh, whatever and flick them our way. We'll be happy to publish it for you. In the meantime, Pete and Donkey, thank you very much. Once again, Thanks, that's mate. another Tuesday night over and done with. And uh, God's willing, God's willing, that Cam and I will be around uh, for the Rev Up pre-match game and then we'll be back on Sunday with the Sunday Wrap. In the meantime... Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for all your support everywhere, and we'll see you later. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys.